Dr. Terry Holden with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to restart community conversations after a year interruption. And she had scheduled last March with us and now she's scheduling it again. Uh, we have a, a tentative conversation plan for the fourth Wednesday of April, but the content is shifting. Uh, so I won't announce it uh, other than same time, tentatively same time and fourth Wednesday. Uh, might as well just dig in. I, I explained uh, to Terry that uh, reminded her of our pattern of, you know, she can say whatever she wants and then we have a either a question and answer or it may move into a discussion. Uh, and with such a small circle here, we probably won't have to use chat for asking questions. <clears throat> but uh, I'll defer to Terry as to how she wants to manage that as as I would manage the questions, but. Uh, that, that's fine, Don, that, that works for me. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity um, to talk. I feel like my, um, my path in getting to know everybody was somewhat interrupted <laughs> last year, kind of my first year. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting back to that. But um, again, Terry Holden, superintendent of Yellow Springs. I'm, I'm in my second year here and I love it. Um, I, I live in the village. So um, that's been a change for me as well because I came from Cincinnati. Um, so um, I'm enjoying it, but again, you know, this pandemic has put a pause on everything. Um, and so now is hopefully there's uh, some light on the horizon. Um, I can get back to doing more things like this and, and meeting more people. But I just want to tell you, I'm going to start first and talk about schooling and, and where we've been since last year and, and, and where we're going. So my work pre-pandemic was really to try and work with the teachers to see what, what do we need to do academically um, to, to continue to meet the needs of our students um, in a way that um, we are used to. Yellow Springs has a tradition of uh, high academics and we wanna make sure that that continues. So that's what we started out um, discussing uh, particularly around project-based learning and how that works with our students. Um, in March, as you know, March of 2020, the governor shut down all schools and we went virtual and finished the school year that way. And you know, when you're asked to do that, um, initially <laughs> with, with very little lead time, it's hard, but I, I have to shout out to the district's teachers as well as students and families who rose to the occasion and we made it work. So fast forward to this school year. Um, we, we discussed um, how we might start the school year. And if you remember, there were high cases and then a little dip and then high cases again. Um, so we started this school year the same way we ended it last year. And that was, we were 100% virtual. Um, I had concerns about safety, certainly, uh, but I also felt like I, I can't run a district if I have no staff. And so um, those were what I call early days of the pandemic. And, and so we were trying to sort things out. So I made the decision, I, I stand by it. I think it was the right decision for us at the time. Um, we went virtual um, 100%. At the end of the first quarter, um, we started thinking about, you know, is this, do we want to continue this? So in November, we, we tried to start bringing students in one day a week on Wednesdays, and this was all volunteer. 
So if you needed extra academic help, um, you could come in on Wednesdays. If you needed to participate in some social activities, um, that was typically Wednesdays also at the middle school, high school, that was Wednesday afternoon. And, and I do wanna say during this time and even last spring, we made, we took great effort to continue serving our students with food because many of our children get breakfast and lunch from us. And so um, that was a big concern for us. How do we continue that? Um, the government assisted in, in making food free um, to all students. So we had a pretty robust delivery system where we would use our school buses to um, deliver the food. And we worked with the um, Yellow Springs uh, Food Pantry to provide dinners. And so we had a kind of a regular rotation um, that we actually continued until just the beginning of this March. So <clears throat> at any rate, that in the fall, in November, we started bringing students in one day a week. Um, in December, we um, started to plan about what happens, you know, how can we potentially look at coming back in a hybrid way or full-time beginning second semester. So um, we created a plan. Now in that plan were metrics because we regularly follow the Ohio's health dashboard, I'm sure you've all seen it, the, the one with the color-coded map that says what color each county is, et cetera. So we, we thought we would use that. Um, and, I, and I wanna say, um, there's been a lot of talk around these metrics um, and the fact that folks feel like I've not followed them. <laughs> um, but, but, I, but my first comment about that is that there's no magic in them. I was just pulling them from the website saying, hey, this data is already available. Seems like good data to use. So we, we crafted a plan to, to begin at second semester, which was January 19th, where week by week, we would look at the data, the safety data to come back. Um, and, and I did that and used those metrics after talking extensively with Green County Public Health. So we charted them. We remained virtual really until um, March 1st. Now, we did not meet our metrics by then, but, but there was a significant event that happened. And that was that our governor, Mike DeWine, said, I'm not going to prioritize teachers for vaccines unless districts agree to come back hybrid or full time by March 1st. You know, I... <laughs> I don't like the um, using healthcare as a tool to get what you want, but I also did not want to deny my staff an opportunity to get a vaccine. And it, it, although it didn't align with our timeline, it did align with our thinking about, we want to get back to hybrid or full-time as soon as possible. What helps us with that? having staff vaccinated. So I agreed to that, which brought us back hybrid um, on March 1st. Um, and, and, and there were some people that weren't pleased. Um, I get it, but, but I wanna say that things change. I mean, that's, that's life, right? You plan for one thing and you have to be flexible to be able to pivot. So we came back hybrid on March 1st, um, and then I got additional communication, um, from parents, um, some of which I'd been getting all year. And that is, I need my child to return full time. And so, you know, these are this, any superintendent today has been in a pretty untenable position. So I don't consider myself different from any of them, but, but our difference here is that we actually were one of the last districts, all virtual. Um, and almost every school district around us, have they've, they've been in session pretty much full time and pretty much for most of the year at 100%. 
you know, and, and I respect those superintendents for making that decision. I made a different decision at the beginning of the year, but um, here we are. And so I, I made the decision uh, in con consultation with the board and looking at health metrics to say that we are coming back full time beginning Monday, 100%. You know, of course, as soon as I do that, the, the health metrics start to rise a little bit. Um, but, but why is that important for us to come back? You know, children need to be in school. And I'm, they have been virtual for one entire year. And while some folks may be able to stay at home and caretake their children, we have folks who aren't able to do that. And then it becomes a real equity issue, right? Um, if you don't have that, your learning loss is accelerated. Um, I don't know that there's any easy answer and I don't know that I'm ever going to make anybody happy, quite honestly. Uh, but that's, that's where we are. Um, we've done as much as we can do to make the buildings as safe as possible. Uh, we spent literally tens of thousands of dollars on tents and tables and air purifiers and cleaning supplies and signage. Um, we know our health procedures, we know our COVID protocols. So now it's really, it's really about personal behavior uh, on, on the part of everyone to make sure we wear masks, we social distance as allowable, we practice good hygiene, we get a vaccine. And I think that really has been um, or, or will continue to be the game changer. Um, getting vaccines, particularly now that 16 students 16 years of age and older um, are eligible. Um, so th that's kind of where we are. You know, it's always, um, I, I, I just want, I guess my message to you is to, I want you to understand the thinking behind my decisions and that I have to think about all of our students. Um, and for as many students whose parents told me they want to remain virtual, I've had that many who say, please, 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 for the love of God, go back full time because my child needs it. Um, and, and so there's the learning loss. And, and unfortunately, there are the mental health concerns. Um, and, and we've had some pretty significant issues at our secondary campus with students um, who are really, really struggling um, with not being in school. Um, so that, that's kind of where we are with that. Um, and then, I don't know, Don, if you want me to stop there before I move to facilities, because I'm happy to, to continue and then take any question about anything or whatever you, how are you think you, you want to frame this? I have one question for yeah, where we are. Questions and then, and okay. then we'll focus on facilities okay. in a second. Sure. Second. Sure. Yes. I'm thinking that my question, hi, Terry. My name is Karen McKee. Um, hi, Karen. I'm wondering, hi, how are you? Um, I'm wondering academically, mm -hmm. how are you planning, or the, is the staff, the teachers planning to sort of make up? the loss of that class time, you did indicate that there, yeah, that's a big hole for some students. Some kids, they can just get on and they're so accustomed to being virtual and of the rest of their lives that it didn't make a difference. Others, that's a little more of a challenge. Is there any kind of plan to um, make compensations for kids who might have sort of lost some of that that one-on-one -on -one with their teacher? Yes. So we're, we're uh, required, not that we wouldn't do it, but we're required to have a, what, what this, the Ohio Department of Education has called a, an extending, extended learning plan for summer to help um, eliminate the gaps that students might have had over the past 12, 12 months. Oh, okay. So, so we're gonna run a pretty robust summer school program and, and this will be in school, in person, and so the academic part will be on um, reading and math tutoring in particular, because those are um, the high priority areas. And really, as you know, the foundation for lots of other things. 
Um, and then we will have what we're calling experiential sessions that, that are not only academic, but help address some of the social emotional issues that students might have had. So that would be um, in uh, art, music, and um, outdoor education. Mm. Um, and that will run um, really June through pretty much for four weeks. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, we're trying to also pay attention to our students with special needs um, mm -hmm. and provide them any additional services that um, they might need because of, because of this prolonged period. Okay, good. Thank you for that. You're welcome. This is Jerry Sutton. Uh, you have postulated a education slowdown or uh, fall off in learning. Uh, what is the plan to take st uh, standardized tests so that we can quantify this and so that we will be able to ascertain when we recover uh, yep. this alleged loss? That's an, an excellent question, Jerry. On so, a school basis and on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as part of normal business, we use a, it's really a diagnostic assessment for reading and math called the STAR assessment. So that's from really grade K through 10. And that's given three times a year. Um, again, for reading and math. And so what we can do by that is we can identify either academic growth or academic loss between each benchmark period. Again, that's something we do normally. Um, that test can be delivered remotely. And so that's what we were able to do this past year. Um, next, and, and, and that will give us data, Jerry, by at the individual student level, at the classroom level and at the school level. Um, we are gonna continue that into next year, but we're changing the test because there's actually another system um, that will provide us even more detailed information. So we'll have that. Um, in terms of state testing, um, you know, sometimes you can get good data from that. Um, last year, um, the tests were not administered, most of them, simply because of the timeline of the closure by the governor. So this year we are required to administer them. Uh, I'm not sure how helpful they'll be. So for us right now, the power is in, is in our benchmark assessment system, the, the STAR system, because that really tells us from, uh, you know, generally it's from end of August to December, December through March, and then March through the end of the year. It will tell us how students do. This is Harry Lipset, because I think Jerry really wanted also to know uh, what data you have to indicate how far our students have slipped. Um, well, based on that data, um, we're seeing much lower performance at this point in the year than we have in previous years. And so that right there um, is an indicator for us. And doesn't that really indicate that a robust require, uh, answer is required? Um, help, help me, uh, give me a little more about what you mean, sir. Well, reading and math are vitally important to go on in school yep. and life. Yep. And uh, the, 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 the loss in reading and math abilities it's nationwide, we know that. Right. Um, right. So uh, it seems to me that, well, first of all, we came here more than 50 years ago because the school system was great. We wanted our kids to get a good education. And I still want that for the rest of the students, for all the students in the village. Um, and so it seems to me that something specific to reading and math needs to try to catch up. Right. So, so what we have purchased this year um, to help with that are two, two systems. I'm going to call them intervention systems. So one is called Lexia Reading, 
and, and there are two parts to that. There's the uh, core five, which is the reading interventions, uh, a reading intervention program for students at the elementary level. That also has a secondary arm called Power Up for our students, perhaps in middle school or high school, who have gotten that far without having the requisite reading skills. So um, every student at Mills Lawn has a Lexia Core 5 license and about one third of the students at the middle school, high school do. Um, so that is what we are using kind of right now for as we look at our benchmark assessment scores and that will tell us what we need to do with the reading intervention program for those students. Um, our math program, Alex Math, works exactly the same way. We use our benchmark assessment scores to say, okay, these students who are not where they should be, where, where do we need to put them in this math intervention program so that we can support them? But we also know that <laughs> students need face-to-face -face interaction with their teachers. They need real-time support. And so um, our return in person as well as our summer school should start helping us kind of write, write this performance. Thank you. Dr. Holden, um, I wanted to ask you a question because you said you said a couple of minutes ago you said that uh, the school is doing their best to keep it safe, to keep the return next mm -hmm. week safe. And I wanted to ask you if you were aware of the discrepancies between what the plan says is going to happen in class and what the reality is going to look like. Like. In the classroom for my kid, there is no room for three feet social distancing between kids. They are around a round table. There are going to be several kids, so they're going to be around maybe two feet, maybe less apart. And that's a real issue here. We're talking about social distancing, which is one of the biggest measures that we need to have in place for safe return. And then the plan online said that they would be grouping for lunch. And upon asking, it became clear that at Mills Lawn is going to be a group of 85 kids together, which really means no group, right? Because the pod is so big. So there is really, it's, it can look like the information on the website, uh, but the return to class may look like misleading and not giving the information to the parents that they need to, to have to make a decision about the safe return of their kids. So in terms of the classroom, you know, we are going to keep as much distance as we can. So for those students where there's two and a half feet or two feet, I mean, and you have to understand, I've had parents measure tables. I can't meet the needs of 700 parents who come in and measure our tables. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But what I can tell you is that <laughs> what we're doing in, on, in that case for those tables, there will be plexiglass dividers. Um, lunch at Mills Lawn. Um, does look a little different. And, and, and again, we, are all, we, we just met again this morning. So as we hear things, we are responding to the best degree possible. So there is a, we have to make a decision at lunch at Mills Lawn. We either have students eat in the gym, all spread out, or we have them eat in their classroom. The classroom then requires travel back and forth. So it becomes a which is the best way. Um, so I will tell you that this afternoon, you're gonna get a video from uh, Ms. Person in terms of what the actual procedures are, as well as uh, Mr. Haddert. Um, and, and again, I can discuss specifics with you. I, I don't, I, I struggle with the term misleading um, because it's not our intent to be misleading, but I just want you to hear from a superintendent's standpoint is that I watch every student in districts surround, around, surrounding us go back to school and those kids are thriving. And it is my responsibility to make sure that our kids here have that opportunity. There is no health director who's going to say, do not send kids back to school. And when I talked to Melissa Howe at Green County Public Health, I mean, she's like, Terry, the kids need to be back in school. When I said we, are, we have been the last man standing, I, that was not an exaggeration. Um, now, 
I, I think there's a way to do it. And, and I, don't want, I don't want you to think that I think any of my surrounding district colleagues are doing it recklessly. They're not. Um, it's just different districts behave differently. And that's why for three quarters of the year, Yellow Springs was virtual. But now it is time for us to, to come back. And, and what happens is that when we hear things on the television, um, there's always the extremes, you know? I, I too watch the news and see the videos, but we are not, we, we have a mask mandate in Ohio. We have a, a rigid mask policy in the district. Um, and so I think the more we can do things like that and, and Dorothy, the more we can keep as much distance as possible. And so when you read the guidance for schools, it says as much distance as practicable. And so when we can't keep that three feet, we have plexiglass dividers. Um, again, I, I'm willing to, to talk to you about this privately. Um, and, and it's also why <laughs> parents were given the option multiple times in August, I said, if you do not, do not want your child returning physically at all during the year, go online now. In December, if you do not want your child returning physically at all, go online now. In February, if you do not want your child going online or, or going in person, go online now. So there have been so many opportunities which, which I felt like was the right thing to do. But I, I, I will say that that's made our work so difficult because we never know. And, and, and again, I think that's the right decision. It is not the decision that many of my colleagues have made who said in August, you get two opportunities. You decide in August and you decide in December and you're doing one or the other. We made a different decision and it was a right decision. But I guess my ask is that people, under, people understand that that we are trying to do the best that we can. And so, you know, I take a little issue with the fact that we are misleading people because um, it, it's, not, it's not the case. Um, but again, I, you know, we talk, so I'm happy to, to talk privately about your specific concerns. We have three tents going up at Mills Lawn. We have a huge tent going up at the high school site so that we can eat outside so that we can have larger classes outside. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that, thank you. I, I guess my specific question was, will you correct the information on the website so that it reflects the reality of what is possible in the schools? Yeah, it, so if you tell me where it's incorrect, because I think the distancing says we will keep three feet or as much as it's practicable. Okay. But just back to you. if you point that out to me, I, I will definitely correct that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Did Megan Colfi want to say something? I, I saw, I saw a yellow line around you a couple times. Yeah. Okay. No, my phone is on the desk. I'm watching. I'm not sure why I did that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Maybe it, it's 11, it's 12 o'clock, roughly half of our scheduled time. I, at one point, uh, Terry said that she had something coming up. Maybe we've, maybe it's looser than it was, but officially we have another half hour. Are there other questions about current operations, about the shift back to full time or full person? or you want us to move on to facilities planning? Facilities planning. Yeah, let's move to facilities okay. so we have time. Thank okay. you. So um, prior to me coming, um, there was a facilities process um, that uh, resulted in a bond issue on the ballot in May of 18 that, that did not pass by a rather large margin. Um, so that's almost uh, three years ago now. Um, and I think the work started prior to, to 2018. So as you know, school facilities uh, have not improved. They don't improve over time. 
Um, so we, we had to, one charge that the board gave to me was to address the school facilities issue. So I took what we learned from 2018 and what the school facilities task force that was created, uh, the information they gathered and um, started a facilities master planning process. So that started in January. And what that is, is a, a group of teams to discuss the current state of our facilities. That's the community advisory team. It's a group um, of parents and students and teachers to discuss the educational visioning, meaning do we have the facilities we need to accomplish the educational vision that we have? Um, and then the goal of, and then a steering team. And the goal of that is to develop a master plan to be approved by the board. That, that's important because right now um, we qualify for a reimbursement from the state of Ohio for a new facility build. Um, and that reimbursement percentage is 26%. And so the way the state goes about figuring that is it's based on property wealth and um, student, student enrollment. So 26% is quite high for us. Um, I think in 2017 when um, the percentage was given, it was 17. And, and so at, at that time, the district decided not to pursue that. We're now at 26%. And so our state consultant, um, she was surprised and she's like, I'm not sure you're gonna get much higher than that. But so that in order to qualify for that, should we decide, should the board decide, hey, we, we do want to take this to the ballot. In order to qualify for that, we have to do a facilities master planning process and present a plan to the board that they approve that we then send to the state. And, and it's called the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, the OFCC. So as part of this process, um, we've developed a pretty robust website called ysforward.com. And on that website, you can find a whole host of information um, about our current facilities. You can find information about all of the work that was done in the past you will find presentations of all of the meetings that we've had. Um, and then it also gives you an opportunity to, to ask questions, to submit questions through the website. So really what we're looking at is, um, and, and I've been pretty public about saying this as superintendent, um, if you ask me, the district is best served by a single K-12. Um, the cost for that uh, roughly is about $35 million. The 26% reimbursement it, it brings it down by about 9 million. Um, there are renovation plans. Um, because our renovation to build new ratio is so high, we would not get reimbursement money from the state. Um, so we could do reimbursement, but that would mean all, all on our own um, dime and the cost is not really different um, if we're talking about apples to apples. So that's kind of the, the big lay of the land. We've had, we've had three community forums um, and right now there's a survey going out to district residents um, about facilities. Again, this is not this is just to develop our facilities master plan. It's not um, a bond campaign at this point. It's just information so that we can come up with a plan that where we say this is right um, for the district. I guess the first question that comes to mind, um, Terry, if you're looking at a single location, where might that be in the uh, village? Um, at the current site of the middle school, high school. Okay, okay. All so, right. so when you work with the OFCC, what they recommend, you know, they don't require it. What they recommend is for 
a site our size, which is a K-12, it's actually for, I think the number is 671 students. They recommend, quite honestly, uh, more than 40 acres. Mm -hmm. Again, they recommend it, they don't require, and, and that's the whole thing. That would be stadium, baseball fields, everything. Mm -hmm. the, current site, the current site there is about 35 acres, just under 35 acres. Mills Lawn in comparison, <laughs> is 8.84 acres. So um, could you put a K-12 on Mills Lawn? Yes. Would you want to? No. I mean, you know, I, I, I was a high school principal for a long time. <laughs> so I know the movement in and out of just what a high school, you, you know, just what there is for a high school. Um, and it's just not, not something you want in such a residential area. One follow-up question. I guess my concern and my my question: What are the legal issues around locating an elementary school so close to a marijuana mm -hmm. facility, Cresco mm -hmm. in this case? Is mm -hmm. aren't there some kinds of requirements that there need to be distanced or some such? I don't know that answer. That's an excellent question. I haven't seen any yet, but that is certainly a question that we have, but I have not seen any. Okay, okay, thank you. I could be wrong, but um, my feeling about what defeated the, this business the first time was the cost. The taxes we pay uh, are the highest in quite an area around us. And it looks like our taxes would be increased by about 10% uh, if you finance uh, $25 million. That's one thing. The other thing is that it would go on for a long time. It would be a long time that we would be paying this much money uh, for the new schools. And my question is, if money was the reason it was turned on. I'll get you one. Oh, okay. you think a better no. Come here. Oh, please mute if you're not speaking. Thank you. Go ahead, Harry. Sorry. I finished. Well, if um, money's the reason, how come the dollars are about the same as they were uh, three years ago? Uh, and if I'm right, three years ago, the, the motion was defeated because of the cost, because of the continuing cost. Um, our taxes are $8,000 a year now. And I think you're looking at increasing them by 10%. Mm. Um, for me, that doesn't matter, but for a lot of folks in the village, it matters a lot. So um, in terms of the 10%, I don't, that's not how I've calculated it, but I don't, I'm not saying that you're wrong. I do know the paper put some information out. Um, Here's what I want everyone to understand. And, and I've talked to, you know, our treasurer talked to Megan um, at the YS News and said, look, here's what we know now, but until we kind of go and do the actual numbers, you know, it could be less. So at any rate, um, the last time the issue was defeated, absolutely. Um, and I've, I, I've heard that was my work pre-pandemic and I heard lots of people talk about why. Um, some folks felt like um, we were not being transparent, which is why I am trying to work overtime about all aspects of the district to be open and share everything. And, and folks have been invited to every meeting. <laughs> um, so that, that was a concern I had or, or that was shared with me. Another concern was that it didn't address Mills Lawn. It only addressed the middle school and the high school. Um, and then I think there were other things, other kind of peripheral things going on at the time that impacted it. Without a doubt, it's more taxes. Um, you know, that's the way schools are funded in, in Ohio. Um, I think the, the, the time, the 37 years, that is standard for a bond issue in Ohio. And here's why it's that long and, and that is the, and again, I don't create these things, but the thinking is that if you're going to build new schools, 
that it ju it shouldn't just be current residents that pay for it. It should be future residents that pay for it. And so if the taxes continue, those folks have opportunity to pay for what they will be using as well. Again, is that is that an appropriate explanation? I don't know. It's just one that, that I have. Um, should the board go to the ballot? I mean, they have a number of options in terms of um, placing the issue on the ballot. It could be all property tax, which quite honestly is cheaper for residents. It could be a combination of property tax and income tax, which has been the history here in Yellow Springs. Um, so there are, are some options there, but you're right, sir. I mean, it, it's expensive. Um, I have a question about the timing. What is the deadline for uh, making a decision that still takes advantage of the state's 26% or whatever? That's a, that's a good question, Don. So the state runs really two, two programs, the classroom assistance program and the ELP program, the ex expedited partnership program. That's the one we're in. So if you're in the other one, which is generally for high poverty districts, if you don't pass it, you can get back on that list at any time and still get the same amount of state uh, reimbursement. For us in the expedited local partnership program, once, so let's say the board approves a facilities master plan at the end of April, it would go to the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission in May they would approve it, it would go to the controlling board end of June, beginning of July, and they would approve it then. Once they approve it in July, we have 13 months to pass it. If we don't pass it in 13 months, unlike the other program where you can just kind of get back to your place in line with the same percentage, you not only get out of line, but your percentage then is quite likely to be recalculated. And so it's really 13 months. Peggy has her hand up electronically. Oh, hi. Right. Let's <laughs> see here. <laughs> uh, unmute. Yes, uh, Dr. Holden, I have two questions. I remember when we passed the permanent 1% income tax for schools years ago at that, I don't remember how long ago that was, maybe at least 15 year, years ago. And they said then that will be the only permanent income tax that Yellow Springs will ever require. And secondly, I also wonder what, I think there's still a bond on the new portion of the Mills Lawn School. Mm -hmm. What will happen with that? Will that roll over? And I understand, you know, making an income tax, a permanent income tax, you know, deflects some of the income tax, pe property tax people would have to pay. But if you look at that number with, I don't know, what do we have? 30% of the village on retirement income. And, you know, we'll probably be dead before this is all paid off how that impacts mm -hmm. the decisions that are being made. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Okay, so you're welcome. Um, in terms of when somebody said 15 or 20 years ago that there will this will be the only permanent income tax, um, I'm sure they said it, <laughs> but, um, and I thank them for that, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know about that, Peggy. Um, here's the unfortunate part. That's how schools are funded in, o in Ohio. We have two options. We have property tax or income tax. That's it. Um, in terms of the portion of Mills Lawn, you're right, there still is a bond issue out on that. I, I'm not remembering off the top of my head when that's paid for, but um, we still have to pay for that. The treasurer can can speak about you know whether that rolls over or it stays separate. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I, I, the answer I have is probably not the one you want and, and is, and that is that the only way we fund what we do is through uh, taxes. We do get state foundation money, which is not a lot. Um, and, and I don't know if all of you know, I'm going to make an assumption and perhaps I, I shouldn't, but you know, school funding, the school funding structure in Ohio has been unconstitutional for uh, quite a while now, since the 90s, I believe, and um, it remains so, and the Ohio legislature has yet to uh, act on that. There is some legislation that will address it, but I don't, we'll, we'll see how that, how that pans out. But this is where we are right now in terms of taxes. I feel like you had a third question in there. And, um, oh, does this, does this have impact on the decisions we make? Sure. I mean, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to burden any resident or taxpayer. And I say that as a resident and taxpayer myself. Um, but there are some things that, that we cannot change and one is how schools are funded. So I think what we all have to do, and, and, but there are ways we can say, okay, is, is the income tax, traditional income tax, earned income tax, is it a combination? But I think even the more philosophical, bigger question is, do we believe in education? Do we value it? Is a school system right for Yellow Springs? And if it is, then we need to figure out how to address the issues that we, that we have. Um, and John Plumbing has his electronic hand up. Hi, Terry, this is uh, John Fleming, and, and I'm going to follow up to the last statement that you made. I'm wondering if, the, if you and the school board had, has, have considered whether or not the village of this size can afford an independent school system, period, or whether um, you might uh, eliminate the high school and combine the high school with other county school and maintain the elementary school. I'm just wondering if you've looked at other alternatives other than what's on the table. Um, we have not had those specific discussions. Um, I have some very strong feelings about that. Um, so in terms of a district this size, um, I can look to Cedar Cliff which actually has a student body of a uh, hundred fewer students. Um, and they are operating quite successfully. Um, I think in terms of when you talk about something like consolidation, um, I think that people need to understand very, <laughs> they need to understand very carefully what's involved in that. And, and again, I'm a newcomer to Yellow Springs, my second year here. But what I have found out is that um, we love uh, our values and we love um, the fact that the schools reflect those values. And so when you talk consolidation, simply because of our size, and I think I'm gonna look to Fairborn to the west, Xenia to the south, Enon to the north, Greenan to the north, and Cedar Cliff to the east. And I, while I respect my colleagues, I can't see in any way, shape, or form how the values of those communities necessarily align with the values of Yellow Springs. And, and so when you're consolidated um, and you're small like us, then you don't really have any say um, in terms of you know, what happened. So we've not really had, that's a long way to say, John, we've not really had those discussions. And, and to me, that, that, that comes as, that would come as an indication from the community that um, we no longer um, feel we can support a school system in the village. Mm. Does anyone else have a question? Yes, I have a comment. Of all of the uh, nearby places that you mentioned, I would think we would most likely line up with Cedar Cliff. Um, certainly not Fairborn or Xenia. Um, we, we know what kind of systems they have and results that they have. And uh, 
what is the, um, the barrier for us to line up with Cedar Cliff? Well, first of all, <laughs> Cedar Cliff has to want it. Um, I'm not sure we line up with Cedar Cliff. Um, it is a highly conservative, highly religious community. Um, so I, I don't know, but that, you, you know, there would be lots of things that would have to happen. And I think that this is a big discussion. And I think um, communities without school systems send a certain message. And, and the question is, is that the message that we want to send? And again, I, I'm gonna go back to the larger facilities discussion about cost. We cannot do anything. I mean, we can proceed as is. It just is not a zero cost option, right? It costs us to maintain um, mm -hmm. systems that are out of date. If that's the will of the community, then we can certainly continue that. Um, but, but it's not, that option is not free either. Anyone else have a question, comment? Yeah. Terry, where do most of our art of districts come from, Xenia? Uh, Xenia, our largest is Xenia, and then Greenan, and then Springfield City. Okay, so Springfield gets to come in even though they're Clark County. Correct. David? Uh, Terry, excuse me, what are the major uh, issues that need attention in uh, both buildings? And is there an est what's the estimated cost of work on these items? The major, major, real serious when the children are falling in holes and dying kind of things, not we like green paint instead of blue paint stuff. Uh, we did that and it's on ysforward.com, but I think, David, that was $12 million. Both buildings? Yep. And even if we didn't do those things, other than the maintenance cost that you were just mentioning, we could limp along like that. We we can time. limp along. Uh, I would not say for a long time. We could we could limp along, and probably at X intervals, the same conversation would would need to be had. Yeah. So over time, it would cost us not much less, if not the same or more. That's that is correct. And the other thing I'm curious about, it not it as expensive or more expensive to buy another building that somebody owns on Antioch campus, for instance, or buy land there or someplace else and then build a new building? Mm -hmm. So yeah. continuing so, to talk about that is sort of a waste of time. Correct. He said pointedly. So, yeah, so two things came up. You know, what about buying land on Antioch's campus? Well, two problems there. The land that they proposed to divest of is not much bigger than Mills Lawn. And, we, and, and the thinking is, and the community advisory team had lots of discussions about this. The thinking is that we already own land. <laughs> so why would we go into debt to buy land when we already have land? Um, other folks have mentioned Antioch uh, Midwest. Um, so I think the last estimate we had to buy that building is about, you know, it's very rough, about $10 million, between 10 to $12 million. But that's just to purchase it. And then you have to go in and retrofit it. And so in the end, um, it's just a lot, a lot more work. It's not as easy as people think, I think, to, to buy a building that already exists and and convert it to a K-12 school. Uh, one minor point is that people whose income is solely retirement income, not earned income, do not pay village tax. And so those of us uh, entirely uh, on retirement uh, would not be responsible for paying the same uh, percentage or same amounts uh, as if we were also uh, earning some income. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Um, 
Yes, right now we have a, right now the district's income tax is a traditional income tax, not an earned income tax. I know, but you've talked about splitting uh, this, this money between uh, village tax and, and uh, uh, income tax. And, uh, no, yeah, I've not talked about, I've not talked about splitting between village income tax. It's just, a, it would be a split between property tax and school district income tax. As opposed to a straight property tax. Okay. Hillary Pearson has been trying to, you need to unmute yourself, Hillary. Hi everyone. I'm glad to have this chance to learn more. Um, I'm, I have a great deal to learn on this issue, but I'm, I'm trying to stay open-minded. Um, personally, I grew up here, and the reason that I came back to raise my three kids is because of the schools and, you know, the town itself. Um, but I feel like the schools are the heart of the village. And um, so when there are discussions about combining with other districts, I try to be open-minded and think, okay, is Yellow Springs just too small? Can we not sustain our own district anymore? Is that just nostalgia I'm feeling? Um, but no, I think there's so much value in what Yellow Springs offers that it is the reason that I came back and so many other people I know came back, um, not to mention the new people that have come. And if it wasn't for the schools, if we combined with Cedar Cliff or whoever we could, I just, I don't know what the draw would be. We would lose a lot of the draw in my opinion. Um, but it's a pickle because you wanna keep the culture and allow people to live here um, on various income brackets. It's one of the beautiful parts of Yellow Springs. Another reason that we moved back here. Um, so how do we pay for what we need without making other people go? How do we afford this? Um, so I'm thinking to myself, you know, it's kind of like our new furnace we just got. It's like, do you keep fixing the old furnace how long can you do that? Does it work for you? Maybe that's good enough for a while. But at some point, isn't it worth it to get a new furnace that's more efficient, um, more cost effective? Um, you know, there are just various costs involved. So I don't have all the solutions. I just wanted to offer that um, the schools, I think, are one of the reasons that people live here. Um, but I'm not sure. And, you know, as, as a person who, who grew up here, it's, it's very sad to think about Mills Lawn no longer being the elementary school. So I have a lot of feelings about that. But I'm also trying to be open to change. And I'm listening to the group that's making all these decisions and learning all the different factors. And I'm opening my mind to the K through 12, because I think that could be really good for our kids. And um, so I just wanted to add those thoughts. Thank you, Hillary. Okay, it's 1230. If there's any other comment or um, closing remarks anyone would like to share. Paul? This please. is Paul. I want to apologize for the false start we had on this meeting. For some reason, the meeting number, which we prearranged, didn't work, and we fell back on the number that we use for business meetings. Um, so uh, one of the things we do in person in our community conversations, I ask the speaker beforehand whether it's all right to tape it. I bring a camera and after the meeting, I ask if I can share the meeting on the Yellow Springs Community Access Channel. Uh, that's still an option. If that's okay, I'll try to edit this down and submit it. If anyone has an objection, then uh, I'll pass. We do save a copy uh, in, our, in our records, which are going to Wright State, where they'll be available for, for many, many years. So again, thank you for coming and uh, apologize for the uh, false start. <laughs> thank you. I, appreci I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you. Thank you. Harry, thank you for being so candid with us. We really enjoyed um, hearing your comments. And it, it is, uh, 
good information to help make some decisions. These are serious decisions that we're going to be having to make in the next short while, because I agree that um, this village values education. And I think it's important to make sure that we get the quality education that I think most of us have enjoyed. I was born and raised here and went through the school system. Um, and so we want to certainly afford that same opportunity to um, the students that are here now and hopefully come in the future. We just, I like the, uh, the question that Hillary posed is now we have to figure out how to pay for it. What's realistic in terms of, because we are an aging community. There are many of us who are in retirement um, and it does impact our ability to, uh, to finance these things. So, 